Uh, those of you in the room and those of you at home, if you want to grab coffee or a treat from over by the kitchen area, you're welcome to do that anytime during the message. Uh, we're going to spend some time unpacking God's Word for today as part of our ongoing series where we've been exploring the book of Colossians. And if you've not been with us the last few weeks, here's how we've been breaking it down. The first four weeks, we're about halfway through now, we've been working our way slowly through chapter one and chapter two of this four-chapter book. Uh, and our theme throughout has been your fullness of life in Christ. And last weekend in particular, that's what Pastor Randy uh, explored during the central part of chapter uh, 2, verses 6 through 15. And I'll touch back on some of that today. But if you've not been with us the last few weeks, you can go to our YouTube channel or to wherever you get podcasts, and you can listen to the first few weeks in this series. Today, as Sarah mentioned during our Big Idea time earlier, we're going to be exploring our sufficiency in Christ, or what it means to be enough. Uh, but before we do that, um, as I think about this word sufficiency and what it means to measure up, it reminds me of when I was in high school. Um, I went to a small Lutheran school from the time I was in first grade through uh, high school, 12th grade. And in fact, that Lutheran high school just uh, closed for good this past summer, right? It had lasted about 50 years and just didn't have the enrollment it needed to carry on. My elementary school is still going and going strong, Holt Lutheran School in uh, the Lansing area in Michigan, but the high school was never very big. When I was there, there were seven kids in my graduating class. There was five girls and two boys, which meant we had uh, the best odds, you would think, in the dating realm, and also if we wanted to play sports or being any plays or anything like that. And I remember my buddy Seth and when we were in our junior, senior years of high school, uh, we were starters on the basketball team. And what we do every time when we uh, came out of the locker room, we'd go through our drills, layups, you know, free throws, all that stuff. But during that time, we'd always be looking at the other end of the court to try to size up the competition, okay? And uh, what I remember vividly is they always seemed massive, and, uh, and they seemed like they were way bigger than us, and they made all of their layups and free throws and the three-point shots even during warm-ups. And every game we'd go into, we'd be like, how in the world are we going to ever match up and try to beat these big giants of opponents uh, and opposing players, right? And we never felt like we would measure up. But I'm pretty sure we didn't have it as hard as... Uh, this particular player, his name is Darnell Rogers, who's the point guard for the UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County Retrievers. Some of you may remember this team, by the way. A couple years ago, uh, they did the unthinkable. They took out, I think it was number one seed Virginia in the first round of the NCAA tournament. The first time that ever happened in the men's basketball March Madness tournament, uh, the UMBC Retrievers uh, upset the number one seed. Now, Darnell Rogers was not a player on that particular team, but he transferred there shortly after and has been the point guard of the UMBC receivers for the last few years. But he's not well known uh, necessarily for his prolific scoring or his passing or any of his stat sheet. What he's most well known for is he is the shortest point guard that's ever played D1 basketball. As standing just five feet two, uh, it looks like he can draw, dribble through the legs of this 6'6 six, six player from LSU, right? And, uh, and, and so what he's known for is being the smallest player ever to play. Now, he, he's used that to his advantage, you might say, and he's got a few things going his way. His dad was also a D1 player. He topped out at 5'3", so he didn't quite make the cut as the smallest D1 player ever, but he went on to play professional ball over in Europe, and that's where Darnell grew up. And so he inherited not just his father's basketball genes, but also apparently uh, his shortness gene. And, and he never let it stop him from pursuing his dream. Now for you, it may not be basketball uh, where you have not measured up. Maybe it's been another aspect of your life. Maybe you've been passed over for a job promotion. Right? Maybe you've never been the smartest kid in your class, or maybe you have never lived up to an older sibling or to your parents' expectation. Maybe you found that you don't measure up in all sorts of areas of life, and you constantly find yourself feeling discouraged, like you just don't have it in you to go to work, to get up 
and try to live another day. Maybe you've taken it a step further and you feel not just discouraged and like the odds are against you, but you're disqualified. Like you don't even compare to your coworkers, your family, your friends. Or maybe you've fallen victim to the devil's greatest deception and you feel like you're already defeated. You don't even stand a chance. Uh, oftentimes in life, we feel these frustrations. We feel like we don't measure up. And sometimes it even spills over into our spiritual life and our relationship with God. Sometimes we become convinced that there's nothing we could ever do to earn the favor and the attention of God because we know all too well our past failures, mistakes, and regrets, and are even our ongoing struggles with addiction or temptation uh, or the things that keep us uh, feeling distant from God, uh, the things we hope that no one ever finds out. The devil's greatest deception is to convince you that you will never be worthy of God's attention and love. And today, what we're going to try to do is help you understand God's answer to that lie. And we're going to do that by taking you back to the end of chapter 2 in Colossians. Uh, Joyce did a great job reading that a little bit ago. And we're going to unpack how, how Paul seeks to address both the crisis in Colossa and the reason for which he's writing this letter, and then also the truth of God's Word that we can grab a hold of today as well. Our reading began uh, with the word, therefore. And if you've ever been in a Bible study or listened to a Bible teacher or preacher, you've probably heard at some point in time, whenever you run across the word therefore, a pretty good idea is to figure out what it's there for, right? Do you like that little play on words? No? Okay. All right. Just keep sipping your coffee. That's okay. All right. I'll just keep going, right? So so what that means is it's a conjunction that's building on what came before. And what came immediately before this, so to understand what we're going to go into, we got to understand where we just came from. Uh, What came right before this in Colossians chapter 2 is our theme verse for the whole series. Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 is the memory verse, uh, and it goes like this. If you want to read this again with me out loud, maybe that'll wake you up. Let's read this together. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made full. All right, this comes in the middle of the passage Pastor Randy taught on last week, and it it encapsulates a lot of what uh, chapters 1 and 2 have been all about in the whole of, of Paul's letter. And it centers on especially how important Christ is to our entirety of our Christian life. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. What that means is that he is fully God and he is fully human at the same time. There's no one else like Jesus. Only he is fully God and fully man. But then it also goes on to say, in each and every one of us who believe in Jesus, that fullness of deity now also dwells. He is within us. And then time and time again, in that short passage of Scripture, Paul just builds on what it means for us to be in Christ. Here's just a few examples. In verse 6, it says, we are rooted in Christ and built up in Him, right? We send our roots down deep into this identity we have in Christ, and and it helps us uh, establish our life and faith. Uh, Verses 9 and 10 says, He fills us with His fullness. Verse 12 says, we are buried with Him in baptism. In verse 12, it adds, we are raised with him through faith. Verse 13 says, we are made alive together with him. And in verse 15, we're promised that we are triumphing in him. And so again and again and again, what Paul wants to make clear is that our faith, our relationship with God is grounded on, established in, and built in one person and one alone and what he has accomplished for us. And that is the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus and his present reign and his promise to return. That is where our life with God begins and where it has its foundation. Right? So having built up to that climax, then Paul is ready now to address the specific controversy in the church in Colossae, as well as to instruct us for how we're to deal with our own temptations and struggles and whenever we fail to measure up. All right, so let's go back to verse 16. We now know uh, what the therefore was about. Paul says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. Let no one try to call into question whether you're worthy enough for God's attention or love. Let no one pass judgment on you in regards to food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These were all parts of the Jewish uh, way of life and still are to this day. They're all spelled out clearly in the Old Testament 
But what seems to be the case is, is a false teacher had come to the church in Colossa and had tried to convince all the believers there that they weren't doing them well enough. They needed to try a little harder or to do them a little more faithfully in order to be fully loved by God. Paul says, don't let anyone try to judge you based on your performance. Because all of these things, they're important, uh, but they're a shadow of the things to come. Uh, the substance, Paul says, belongs to Christ. The author of the letter to the Hebrews says something similar in chapter 10. And if you want to go explore it more fully, what it means to be a shadow and then to be fulfilled in Christ, here's how that chapter begins. Verse 10, verse, chapter 10, verse 1 says, For since the law, all that God said in the Old Testament, since it, has, uh, it is but a shadow of the good things to come, uh, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. What he's saying is all of the blood of the goats and the rams and the, and the, and the cows that were offered in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, uh, they never in and of themselves had the power to forgive sins. They only did because they pointed forward to the Lamb of God whose shed blood would take away the sins of the world. Right? Everything that God had spelled out for his people in the Old Testament was all designed to, put forward, to point forward to Jesus. And Jesus himself unlocked the minds of his disciples to understand how everything written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms was written about him. That's what Jesus claimed. And that's what Paul and the author of the letter Hebrews is saying here. So all of these things, they do matter and they have their place. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But they're not things that we do in order to get God to like or love us more. They're a shadow that points forward to the fulfillment and the work that Christ has accomplished for us, his perfect life and then his death in our place. Now let's press on a little bit more to understand the conflict in that day and how we can draw some truth from it as well. He said, let no one uh, seek to uh, uh, disqualify you, insisting on aestheticism and the worship of angels. Aestheticism uh, would be the discipline of trying to abandon or set aside certain earthly things, whether it's food or drink or going to live in poverty or out in the wilderness. And uh, this word is interesting uh, because uh, it's translated everywhere else in the New Testament as humility. But only here in Colossians chapter 2 is it translated in this word asceticism. And asceticism isn't bad. Giving up something isn't necessarily bad. So for example, some of you may have the tradition of giving up something for Lent or either chocolate or soda or something else like that. Um, not a bad discipline as long as its focus is to reconnect you with God. But when it becomes uh, the thing that you're pinning your hope on, when you think, if I just try a little harder, give up a little bit more, and then maybe God will love me, that's when it's being used for the wrong reason. That's what Paul's trying to address. Or, or, or the worship of angels, that was especially prominent throughout what's modern-day Turkey in Ephesus and then also in Colossae. He says uh, this false teacher was trying to press in on those things, trying to disqualify believers from being fully committed and fully loved by God. And he was going on in detail about these visions he had puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And then a little later on in verse 20, Paul says, if with Christ you died to all of these things, died to the elemental spiritual of the world. Why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to these regulations about what you can touch or what you can taste or what you can hold, referring to all the things that perish as they're used, according to human precepts and teachings? Paul says, don't fall back into that false religion that says you have to do certain things in order for God to love you more or to welcome you into his family. Verse 23, Paul concludes chapter 2 with these words. He says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom and promoting the self-made religion and asceticism and the severity of the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Paul says, you can try your hardest to be the best you can be, but you will never measure up to the perfect standard of God's law. And so if you try to approach religion, if you try to approach a relationship with God on the basis of doing all the right things and getting your life in order, you will always find yourself coming up short, never measuring up, always being disappointed, always being saddled by guilt and shame. Paul says you can't do a relationship with God in that way. Instead, it has to be the other way around. It has to be like David, uh, who after being confronted in his sin, 
having committed adultery with the beautiful wife of one of his best friends and shoulders, Bathsheba, and then conspiring to having Uriah the Hittite killed so he could cover up his sin. When David was finally confronted in it in Psalm 51, we're told of the path we are to follow. He cried out to God and he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, but restore me, he says. A broken and contrite heart, he says, you will not despise. So there is nothing we can do to try to earn back God's favor and attention. There is nothing we can do to outweigh the wrong that we have done and may continue to do. If we try to approach a relationship with God on the basis of our best efforts, we will always fail to measure up. And while there is a place for us to focus on proper spiritual discipline and how to try to contain and control our best efforts and direct them towards a positive direction. We're going to come back actually in chapter 3 and chapter 4, the next four weeks, and look at what the holy life of a follower of Jesus should look like. We have to always start with the recognition that our relationship with God and his approval of us always comes first from the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And then grounding ourselves in that, we're ready to try to live the best life that he can call us to live. Right? How does that fit into all of this? Let's jump back a little bit, a few verses, to verses 18 and 19. Let no one disqualify you, he says, insisting on all these religious rites and behaviors, and not holding fast to the head. Notice how it's capitalized there? Not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. What Paul is saying here is that the way forward for a follower of Jesus is to grab hold of Jesus and never let go, holding fast to the one who is the head and the ruler of all authorities. Sorry, I went in the wrong direction. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, You have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Right. So in verse uh, 19, he's talking about Jesus. He's saying, how do we uh, get right with God? We simply cling to Jesus. How do we know that we measure up? We simply cling to Jesus. We hold on to what he has accomplished for us, his perfect life in our place, and then his sacrificial death in our place, and then his resurrection life, which gives us freedom and hope and a future, and which promises us growth that is from God. I love how our theme verse this year at St. Peter is more like Jesus, and it's based on another promise in a passage from Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 that says we are growing in every way more and more like Jesus. Friends, throughout our life, we have room to grow when it comes to self-discipline and and putting into place uh, the fruit of the Spirit and putting into practice Jesus' words and His ways. Right, That's what we commit our life to so that we can live most fully now and also give the best witness to others. But remember, and never forget, that always follows the beginning and the foundation, a relationship with God based on holding on to Christ and all He has done for us. That alone promises us the forgiveness, the love, and the favor of God that can never be taken away. So don't let anyone disqualify, discourage, or cause you to doubt. You are loved by God because of what Jesus has done for you, and then you're set free to live a life that looks more and more like Jesus. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that through your word you teach us truth that never fails and that never fades. We know at times we struggle to live up to your best, and sometimes we even fall into Satan's lie and become convinced that if we just try a little bit harder or do a little bit more, you'll love us more, or we'll feel less guilt and shame. Instead, God, we pray that you would come and forgive us of all of our sin. Renew us by the power of your, uh, of your son, Jesus, and his shed blood on the cross. Set us free from the doubt, shame, and regret that haunt us constantly. And give us the power of your spirit to live a new life each and every day. God, we pray that you would continue to renew us in body, mind, and spirit. That we would grow in every way more and more like Jesus. And in this way, experience fullness of life now and eternal life with you for forevermore. So God, each of us come with regrets, with mistakes, with sins that we have committed uh, already this morning and certainly in this past week. And so we confess those to you and ask that you would remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. Renew us in body, mind, and spirit. Forgive us of our sin. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.